I'm late. I'm late. I apologize. I was busy trying to get StreamYard to work, and it didn't want to work. So apologies. And welcome, everybody, to the Squirrel Squadron and to my event on Swiss Army Knife Technical Teams. How do you make a technical team bigger than a technical team? That's the puzzle for today. And I hope all of you can hear me. Now, uh, I normally have Laura, our erstwhile community manager, but she is being erstwhile elsewhere. So uh, I don't have her here. So can somebody please comment and just tell me you're out there. <laughs> tell me you can hear me and see me and that it's all working because I don't have a way to check that the way I normally do. So uh, would somebody please just help me out in that way and uh, help me make sure that I've got um, uh, everything set up correctly. And you, uh, most importantly, you can hear me because I have to move the microphone slightly out of the way. David says hi. Um, I assume that means David can hear me, but um, uh, would you mind just uh, giving me a quick, yep, I can hear you, or nope, you're not there. Um, I guess uh, if you, okay, good. David says he can hear me. Good. I was going to say, if you can't hear me, how would you know? But um, uh, thankfully, we didn't wind up in that situation. Good. So if you don't know where you are or what you're doing, uh, welcome to the Squirrel Squadron. I'm Squirrel. Uh, I'm the host. Uh, well, I do these uh, events every week for my community of tech and non-tech people getting together and talking about all kinds of things that are important to making your technology insanely profitable. Um, oh, and Ben says, we're not live on LinkedIn, but I'm getting David saying he can see me on LinkedIn. So I'm going to assume it's working. And um, uh, uh, Ben, don't worry about it. You can see me on YouTube. That's good. Um, if you can't see and hear me, go to YouTube. But I don't know how you'd know. Um, David says he can see me. So I assume it's all working. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But we, we've at least got David and Ben, and I see uh, more people joining. So uh, I, I think we're on track. Let's see how that goes. Um, let me just tell you a tiny bit. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you have to go anywhere or do anything um, uh, during this, uh, there will be a recording on, on all these platforms, I think, uh, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, assuming it's all working. So uh, glad to see all of you. Okay. Super. Everyone says it's working. Good. Um, let me just tell you a tiny bit about the Squirrel Squadron. For those who don't know, um, we have these events every week. Uh, what have we got coming up? We've got one next week on why you don't want a big bang. And I don't mean the start of the universe. I mean where you go from version one to version two all in one day. That's a very dangerous uh, technology approach. Don't do it. Um, another dangerous approach is uh, using an agency to build some or all of your software. And uh, it can work well, both of them can work well, but I'm gonna talk about the dangers and the uh, pitfalls and, and what can go wrong and what else you might try. Um, and then I'm live in London in person uh, on the 16th of November. And there I'm talking about how to make an insane profit from your tech team by um, uh, measuring it. And it turns out that you don't need to be a coder to measure your tech team and to understand uh, where they're weak, where they're strong, what kinds of things you need to improve. So I'm going to take you through the radar that I use in my due diligence and health checks uh, uh, and the, the six main um, uh, measurement areas that you need to look at. So uh, we'll be doing all of that in the future. Uh, you'll find all of that at squirrelsquadron.com. I'll put up a link at the end, I'm sure, assuming I remember. Somebody remind me. Um, but uh, you can find uh, all that stuff and sign up there. There's also a forum uh, where many of you have been coming. I know Ernie's there and Ben's there. Uh, seen comments from you this week. Thank you. And um, uh, we've got discussions going there. I just posted something on automating your own software. So uh, without coders, how do you automate the, the tools that uh, that you use, the, uh, the manual processes you're operating on? Um, we had questions and comments on uh, quantifying your uh, technology, understanding how to understand well, when it's good to make improvements. How do you quantify that? So lots of great discussions happening uh, on the forum. So uh, head on over there. Uh, I'd love to see you uh, anywhere in the squadron. Now, what we're talking about today is um, uh, how to get a, a technology team that's broader than just cross-functional. So uh, I realized when I was uh, preparing for this that I'd actually done an event three, four months ago on cross-functional teams. And there I really talked mainly about uh, how to be an effective um, uh, uh, team of front-end and back-end and data and so on, getting all the technical functions together. Here I'm going to talk about getting people who are not technical to go sit with coders. Now that may seem very strange. Um, you, may, you know, those those nerds over there with the pocket protectors and the the Star Wars T-shirts and things like that. 
they're kind of scary. And often they're not the friendliest folks in the world. So getting your customer service people to work with them, getting your sales people to work with them, getting your uh, finance people to work with them sometimes can seem pretty daunting. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today. That's, uh, that's the topic. So I hope you've all come for that. Uh, nobody's surprised. Now, um, uh, these go better for those of you who are new uh, if you ask me lots of questions. So I've just seen four or five different people commenting. Thank you. You told me that we're live. Great. Uh, but don't just do that because um, uh, if you if you don't do that, I'll go through the stuff I've got here and I'll chat for a while and I'll have a blast and I'll think up stuff and have a good time. But you won't get your question answered and, and it won't be as effective and, and we'll probably finish early. However, if you ask me lots of questions, bug me, disagree with me, argue, um, uh, that's very effective. That's very helpful. I wrote an entire book on how to have uh, productive conflict. So I'm interested in productive conflict here. Please uh, ask questions, interrupt, um, uh, make points. Uh, I wish you could talk back to me. That's just not how live streams work. But I would sure love to hear from you about um, uh, any questions, any topics. Just stick them in the comments. I, I should be able to see them. I, I see everybody's comments so far. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from, from any and all of you, uh, including those who haven't commented yet. So if you have a specific question, if there's something that brought you here, get that in, get that in the chat now so I can make sure to include it. So uh, uh, please comment there. Uh, otherwise, listen up and I'll tell you some stories and that should trigger some questions uh, and we'll get going that way. Good. So I promise stories. I always tell stories. Let me start you off with a very old one. So at one point in my very early career, I went and um, consulted with a water company in the north of England. Millions of customers and the oldest systems you've ever seen because they had computerized, but kind of um, uh, reluctantly in the 1970s. So they had an ancient computer system. I, I'm not sure if it was using punch cards or not, but it was. Uh, I'm sure it was using those great big disks that go turning around like this, not little ones you can fit in your pocket, but the great big ones, and you take them off the rack and you carry them around. You know, it felt like my father's uh, computer center that he worked in um, when I was a very little boy. So they had this ancient, ancient, ancient system, and they kept the thing running. And they were serving 3 million customers. They were giving them water. They were answering all their questions. They had a big call center full of people who were uh, dealing with uh, chiefly billing issues. And that was what we were automating for them and bringing them into the, the 21st century, which had just started. Uh, so this is 23, 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, they um, needed us to, to modernize this system so that they could actually send the bills effectively. Uh, now, we, they did a very clever thing. I wasn't smart enough to, to know to do this. Uh, somebody much smarter than me figured out that um, uh, this cross-functional, this Swiss Army knife team would be effective. They said, we have this ancient, ancient system, and we've been doing weird stuff to it since 1974. So we're going to bring in some people who actually work with it some actual operators, some actual people in the customer service team who uh, bring the software uh, uh, up, to the, up to modern standards by hook or by crook, who do all kinds of weird stuff to it. And they're going to sit right with you developers as you are building the new billing system, and they're going to make sure you don't screw it up. And I thought this was pretty weird at the time. I said, oh, man, you know, what are these people going to add? They can't write code. Uh, I mean, these people answer the phones all day. Uh, I'm sure they're very nice, but what are they going to add for us? They added a tremendous amount of value. And uh, they were never bored. Uh, there were uh, a large number of us, 40 or 50 uh, of us engineers, too many, in fact, but that's another story. Uh, and uh, there were uh, four of them. And we, we had some, they were the Fantastic Four or something like that. We had some name for them. I can't remember. And, and this Fantastic Four group was just our oracle on everything that uh, was mystifying about the old system. So we would find somebody's telephone number, and the telephone number would be star star, uh, not 77994369, whatever it was. And we say, what are these stars? You know, well, I wonder if that phone number works. And press star star on your phone, start, it doesn't work. You don't get anything. And we'd go over to the Fantastic Four, and we'd say, uh, folks, what do these stars mean? And they say, ah. Well, you know, people invented mobile phones about 20 years into the life of this system, and we had to distinguish the mobile phone from the home number. So uh, this is a mobile phone number, and the mobile phone numbers all start with star star, except that certain phone numbers, uh, which have a different extension, uh, well, the system won't accept those, so we have to put a star slash. 
and they had this whole uh, sort of setup, and and I don't know how they trained the new people in it because it was it was uh, Byzantine. It was bizarre what they had to do to make this system work. But they knew where all the bodies were buried. They knew all the weird exceptions. They knew everything about how it worked. And every time we encountered something odd, we could always go to the, fa the Fantastic Four and talk to them. And they didn't only just sit there and wait for our questions to be answered. They were also active in testing, in designing, in reviewing documents, in working with us, um, even just sitting in our meetings and saying, you know, that's not going to work because because they had all this secret, very valuable information. Then they were being pulled off the line. You know, they weren't actually answering phone calls while they were with us, of course. But they, they that was their normal job, was operating the system, answering calls, um, updating bills, fixing problems, and so on. And, and because they knew everything, they made our, our jobs much, much, much easier, and we were much more effective because of it. So that's kind of the model I have in mind, is um, you're going to get tremendous value from taking people who do not write code and putting them next to us geeky, weird, Star Wars watching um, engineers and having us work together. But that's not obvious. It's not easy. It's not um, something that people do all the time and uh, that you can do intuitively. So I'm going to tell you some of the tricks and traps and, and some things that work and don't work uh, when you do that. Uh, OK, uh, and somebody. LinkedIn is weird sometimes. It doesn't tell me who, but somebody says, um, achieving cross-functionality when dev and test are outsourced to different orgs. Oh, man. OK, let me come back to that one. That's a very interesting one. I want to talk a bunch about testing. Um, and uh, I'm going to look for, for ways to make sure that you can get those organizations together. That's a good puzzle. Let me, let me uh, come back to that when I cover testing. Um, so uh, let me just first cover uh, who you might consider for this. So, so I've just said customer service. In, in our particular case, we knew this water billing case. We, we knew that the customer service people were kind of the nexus. Everything that went wrong went wrong starting in customer service. Not that they caused it, but that they understood how it how it broke. They all oh, yes. When we run the bill on Thursday and the person's telephone number starts with seven and uh, their last name starts with Q, we have to do this special rule. So they knew all that stuff, even though the problem might be in the printing of the bills or it might be in um, the the coding of the software or something like that. So uh, we knew that they were folks who had tremendous amounts of knowledge. But that's not the only font of knowledge. There's lots of others. So I have seen uh, successful uh, collaboration uh, involving salespeople who, who are out there actually talking to customers and who come back and say, this is what I heard, and, and um, work collaboratively to build a version that will sell to that customer in the future. Marketing people. Uh, I have a story about that, remind me to tell you. Um, marketing folks can be tremendously valuable in understanding what they're going to market, and they can write the press release before you build the software. That's a, quite a good trick uh, that, that helps a lot. Um, you can use uh, people, I'm trying to read my notes here, sorry. Uh, you can use people from operations. So there might be folks who are um, printing bills in the, the billing case. There might be people who are um, uh, uh, interacting with vendors or uh, dispatching trucks or whatever it is that the system does. And, and those people are often just like the customer service people really at the nexus of where things don't work. And they'll show you the special spreadsheet that they use to work around some problem. And, and that can be tremendously valuable to have. Um, and I think that covers, yeah, that covers the ones that I've seen. But I bet some of you will have other examples. So I'd be very happy to talk about that. So um, uh, what I want you to be thinking about is uh, wh who could come and help my engineering team who doesn't write code? Uh, and uh, there are probably even more um, uh, outside folks that, that we could think about or talk about. That, oh, there's one other that's important, um, which is there are sometimes people who have a title like data science. Um, but they're not actually writing code every day. If you're a data science team and you're writing production code that people use, you're probably working closely with the developers anyway, and you're a bit of a geek yourself. But there are people who are business analysts who go and find data, find new markets to look at or, or different customers to, to work with or analyze uh, usage patterns. Uh, they're, uh, and they're using a bunch of tools but are not coders. Um, and uh, there are also data scientists who are doing very theoretical work um, and not, never touching production. So that's kind of a more geeky end that's more um, engineering focused um, than I'm going to talk about mainly. But a lot of these tools also work for those folks. So if people are interested in uh, getting those folks in, uh, I'm very happy to talk about that too. 
Um, but uh, if you're thinking somebody is too far away or too uh, distant from the, the code and the software and the product, uh, you're, you're wrong. That's what I'm here to tell you. So I, I want to talk about how, how you can do that. OK. Um, so uh, let's think about uh, how somebody like this could be productive, because one of the first things people ask me when I say, oh, yeah, bring those people in to work with the tech team is they say, uh, well, those folks are going to be bored. Uh, I mean, they're bored out of their minds. They're, they're used to being productive on the phones or uh, working with the vendors or doing the, the finance work or uh, uh, doing the analysis. And, and suddenly you're going to tell them, sit around and wait until the engineers do something. Do not have them sit around and wait. I have done that, and it was very unproductive. So uh, I had one case where um, uh, I got a cross-functional team together, and I said, okay, your mission is to, to achieve this objective, to get to um, increased conversion rate. We want more people to come to the site, uh, buy the product, and, and move ahead. Um, and uh, uh, you guys figure out how to do that. And there were marketing people who knew what the marketing approach was, and uh, there were uh, customer service folks who, who knew what kinds of questions came in as people were trying to make their payments and so on. And I thought, oh boy, this will be great. It wasn't great. What they did is they just came to the stand-up. So the team had to stand up every morning and, and discussed what was going to happen. And occasionally they'd make some contribution. They'd say, oh, try this or ask me about that or something. And then they'd go back to their desks and do their job. And that wasn't a cross-functional team. That wasn't a Swiss army knife that could handle any problem that was uh, uh, able to make changes in uh, broader, uh, that were broader and went outside the technology organization. Um, they, they were just being very brief, um, uh, uh, brief, briefly involved advisors and not very involved. Um, so that's a, a recipe for failure. So, so don't do that. Uh, what you want is for uh, at least half the time, the, the person who is non-technical participates in the life of the team. And in, in actual fact, if you look around a technology team, there's an awful lot of stuff that is not typing in code. You know, I had one uh, CEO early in my uh, career who said, yeah, could we send the engineers on typing classes so that they could get more software done? That, that was not a good idea. And I had to explain that to him. And I, I wasn't very good at it at that point. Um, the, the goal of a software team, of course, is to produce useful software. There's an awful lot of stuff you do that isn't writing code. And so uh, uh, a non-coder can participate in almost all of those. For example, uh, you probably have some people who do something uh, related to design. They, they somehow get beautiful screens up with uh, buttons and uh, uh, lights and, and uh, uh, text boxes and all the other good stuff. They um, uh, figure out what the flow should be and uh, what uh, stage you should go to and, and what uh, should happen if you get an error. Uh, so those folks uh, are really, really good to collaborate with these, uh, with these users. Uh, to make sure that uh, the actions that they're taking are actually going to work when they're using the software. I should say this as well, sorry, I missed an important group, which is customers. So um, you might sell to businesses, in which case you could bring in interested people from the actual businesses that are your customers, or you might sell to individuals, uh, in which case you might bring in proxies or, or people who know those customers or even examples uh, to be part of your team. Now that's a little more challenging. Customers usually have another job to do, so it's a little harder to get their um, their involvement. But if you can, it has tremendous value. So the, the same, um, uh, same comments apply to, to folks like that. Now, um, uh, design is certainly a great place for uh, non-coders to work, and, and they can work by pairing. They can work by sitting next to the designer, helping to draw things, scribble things on paper, um, make comments on um, uh, prototypes. There's lots of back and forth that you can do, so you're actually doing the work together. Uh, and of course, they're not skilled designers, so they might not come up with the most uh, usable or beautiful or um, uh, intuitive interface, but they're going to know what's going to confuse them. So uh, that's uh, a very good place where they can uh, spend good quality time with the team. And I wish the people that I'd had just coming to those um, stand-ups had, in fact, worked with, with the designers, because that would have been a great place to improve conversion rate, right? Make the site more easy to use, fewer steps. Um, they, they would have had a big influence. And I, at that time, didn't know uh, how, to, how to make that happen. Now, there's, uh, I wanted to come uh, to testing, and I'm going to make sure to comment on this user's question. Um, uh, the... the uh, testing is a place where non-coders can have tremendous influence and not just in UAT, you know, the time when there's some software that's done and they go bang on it for a while and they tell you what's broken about it. 
They're tremendously helpful when you are designing tests, when you are figuring out what uh, what to test, what the software should do, um, uh, how to verify that it's doing the right thing. And they can get right down into the code to do that. So I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, so uh, I had a uh, client uh, who uh, had a lot of langu uh, human language um, features in their software. So a big part of what their software did was to take things like, I don't know, Bangladesh prison records or uh, Thai ship um, uh, uh, manifests and things like this and take them from those languages and translate them into a common language, typically English, and um, give valuable data to people uh, to, to actually make use of those records. And it did this automatic translation. Uh, a little before we had the, the generative AI and, and Google Translate and so on tools that we have today. So it was fairly advanced for the time. And uh, there was a person who really knew this business. He really understood how this worked. Never written a line of code in his life. That wasn't his, his skill. He actually became a software developer later, but that was uh, a later development for him. Um, as I brought him in to be a tester for this team, he said, Squirrel, I never tested anything. I don't know what I'm talking about. And I said, do you know these languages? He said, oh, yeah, I speak a whole bunch of languages. I understand the language issues. I deal with those issues all the time and the mistranslations and so on. So I said, great. Make yourself a list of the things that the developers screw up. And, oh, yeah, I know what those are. And so he came up with individual words and phrases in different languages that, that cocked up the, the software. So um, he'd have a Hebrew phrase. And of course, Hebrew goes um, the opposite direction to English. Uh, and you have an Arabic phrase that had a different characteristic in Japanese, which is top to bottom. And, and you know he had uh, loads of different examples. He, he printed them all out and we laminated it. Um, and so it became a checklist for the developers and they all had them on their desks. And before they brought the software to him to do some manual testing, they had to show him that they had ticked off all of these different examples. And yeah, I've done every one of these and I verified that it doesn't break on these. And he'd say, great. And then you'd find another one and he'd add to the list and we'd reprint it. So that was a way that we created a structure. And I'm going to talk more about that later, the, the importance of a structure for these people that you bring into the team. Uh, we created a structure for him to be effective. So he could do some manual testing of the software when it was done, but much earlier than that, he could give them this list so that when they were designing the software, when they were testing it themselves, when they were building the tests that would run uh, to verify that the software was working correctly, they could take into account all these examples. So that uh, bringing those examples was really helpful. Uh, Stuart says something, but I can't actually read it. So uh, Stuart, I'm not sure what you said, but you might try it again. <laughs> it's glad to, good to see you, but... Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's coming through. Um, now, let me deal with this uh, question that I got about um, dev and test being outsourced to different organizations. So um, I, I'm assuming an outsource typically means that people are in um, some faraway country. So I'm going to assume that. If they're, if they're nearby, you got a, a, an easier problem. But um, the, the difficulty there is I think you're not going to have the business expertise because you're outsourcing both of these functions. And um, it's going to be difficult to get your business expertise, which I assume is in your home location. That's typically the situation um, or, or, or more centralized. And, and then these kind of distant organizations that maybe are in faraway time zones or aren't knowledgeable. Oh, Stuart got rid of his comment. OK, fine. Well, uh, make your comment again. I'm interested, whatever it might have been. But um, uh, uh, the, the person, somebody else who, who, who made this comment, sorry, I just can't see your name. Um, uh, just let us know if that's your situation, because I'm going to assume that that's the most common one that I that I get this kind of question about. Um, and, and so there, the difficulty is going to be communicating with these business experts, the people who are knowledgeable about what's needed, the marketing people or finance or, or customer service that I'm referring to. In, in the water billing case, we were all in one big room. And so when we wanted to see the Fantastic Four, we walked over to the Fantastic Four. We say, hey, yo, guys, what do we do? What's this asterisk mean? Um, and, and so that was very simple. You've got a much more challenging situation where developers are far away and testers are far away from them, uh, and, and neither one has access. So uh, the thing I would do there is to make sure that there are um, wide and frequent channels of community and multiple channels of communication to those people. Uh, I'll just tell you a couple versions of that. One is, of course, to have a Slack channel or something like that, where the Fantastic Four or your equivalent uh, is available to those people and that they're available to each other. The dev and test people can talk to each other and ask questions. The difficulty with something like a Slack channel is it's very noisy. It can, the conversations get, get lost. 
you know, it's, it's not as organic as having people in the same room, but it certainly helps. So, so that could be one. Another that, uh, that I've used very successfully in the past is an, an open window. So uh, just like you can see into my 600 year old house behind me um, uh, uh, through the medium of your screen, you can have a screen within your organization and maybe you have one in the dev team's organization, wherever they, they are. Um, and that screen is always up. And on that screen, somebody can walk up and say, uh, hey, you know, you were asking a question about these asterisks or this special uh, process that we use in finance. Um, you know, where's uh, George? I'd like to tell him about it. Uh, so uh, that's a way of having very high bandwidth, uh, immediate interaction, has some higher cost, um, does require that people be in an office, which isn't always the situation. Uh, you can also approximate this with a, a kind of open uh, video channel. Uh, so somebody just gets on a call and they're, they're available and somebody can kind of knock on the window virtually and say, hey, you know, can I ask you a question? So you want that kind of um, open access. Uh, and then the last thing to do, of course, is get these people pairing. So I talked about having the, um, well, I gave a couple examples. So uh, the, the guy who had the list uh, that was laminated, um, you know, he was sitting with the team, but, but he was also working with them on the tests. So there would be a time when they'd say, okay, fine. Uh, I don't understand this Japanese thing. Can, can you show me? And he'd come over to them and he'd sit and write the code with them. Now, of course, he, he didn't know the code, so he, he couldn't contribute to you know, where the semicolons went and, and that sort of thing. But he could say, uh, yeah, you're, you're putting in the wrong characters. Should be these ones. Well, wait a minute. Have you made sure you checked it um, uh, for when there's a comma at the end? Because sometimes in Japanese you put a comma here, whatever it was. So uh, you could set up pairing sessions among these people uh, to create that kind of uh, organic um, uh, interaction and, and uh, collaboration. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, oh, uh, I think it's Ben who's asking that. Bits of nearshore, remote, and uh, on-prem. Excellent. You got everything, Ben. You got it all covered. So I hope those ideas are helpful. Um, and uh, if they aren't, uh, ask again. Tell me more. Uh, but that, that's how I would handle uh, this kind of interaction. Get as much bandwidth as you can, uh, as frequent and, and vigorous as you can. Um, and uh, if you need to, uh, create pairing sessions uh, for these folks to interact. Uh, okay, what else have I got? Um, now, uh, a, a trick you can use that wasn't available to me back in 2000, whatever it was, um, is these uh, kind of low code tools. And um, I'm of a mixed uh, opinion about these. Uh, they're, uh, some of them work really well. I was just writing about it on the forum. The uh, things like Excel, uh, which is nice and old and been used for this kind of thing for a long time, or Airtable, which is a little newer, or Zapier, or other things like that. They're, they can be good for somebody who's not a coder to do a prototype so that you can see what the results are. If, they, if you can teach them to use something like Figma to make a clickable prototype, that can work really well as well. Some of the best product managers I know who've come into Teams and actually worked with them full time uh, have been people who started that way, um, designing software, giving feedback on software from the outside inside the business, knowing the, um, uh, the industry. Uh, and, and providing these kinds of low code uh, prototypes, ideas, descriptions of how the software should work. So uh, be careful with that because uh, the danger is um, the low code can either be um, a big investment, a kind of a sticky tar ball where you need to spend a lot of time learning how to use it and it causes a lot of problems and it's hard to maintain. You don't want to keep that stuff around. You want to work it into your, your actual software uh, pretty quickly. Um, but uh, if it does empower them, if you find that the, the software is easy to use, that they pick it up quickly, that they're able to give you feedback on the spot immediately, it can be very valuable um, and a, a relatively recent uh, invention. Now, um, I'm just going to, I'm getting old, so I can't always read my uh, scribbles. Let me see if I can remember this one. Uh, more generally, you can get people pairing on building prototypes. And um, again, this emphasize is that non-coders can sit with coders and do work together. This seems weird. Actually, developers can do this together, and it's actually a very effective technique. But you can do it with somebody who is not a person who writes code. Now, of course, they probably won't have their hands on the keyboard very much. That's OK but they can sit there and look at what the coder is doing and surprising amounts of it can be comprehensible, especially with somebody there to explain. 
One of the best places for this is with testing, coming back to that again. So uh, good engineers write lots of unit tests. These are um, pieces of uh, little pieces of software that, that validate that uh, the, the whole system does what it's supposed to in a certain circumstance. So that if I type in a telephone number that's 30 digits long, it goes, beep, your telephone number is too long. If I type in a telephone number that's one digit long, it says, beep, your telephone number is one digit, it is too short. Um, but the customer service person might look at those two tests that I just made up and say, for my example before, hey, yeah, but um, you know, you're giving an error when you put in an asterisk. We're, us customer service people, we're going to want to put in an asterisk. And then you can say, oh, what's the asterisk for? How do I use it? And then you can give a more useful error like, hey, put that in the mobile phone field. It's two, two fields down. So then you're actually helping the customer service people who are used to doing whatever strange thing it is that only that person knows. So you're getting an awful lot of knowledge from that person and saving a ton of time with somebody filing a defect and being confused and getting trained and documenting stuff and so on. You're actually handling it way upstream at the time when the developer is writing the code. So um, uh, uh, use this uh, judiciously. Uh, if uh, developers are writing some horrendous uh, database query that's very complicated and involves uh, tons of very technical stored procedures or something, uh, the uh, poor uh, non-coder is going to be completely lost. So that's not useful. But there are lots of places, including front-end design, uh, design itself, so building the, fr the, um, uh, the, the prototype, the um, uh, design documents, but also actually writing the code that creates uh, the, the objects on the screen that the person interacts with, um, and um, uh, creating these tests. Those are, are good places where a non-coder can pair with a, uh, a coder and have tremendous effect. So that can have uh, a very high value. Uh, let's see. Um, now, uh, how do you mechanically, how do you, in, in process terms, uh, get these folks to be successful? So um, I, I told you the kind of anti-story, <laughs> and I have another one to tell you later, um, uh, where uh, I just said, hey, marketing folks, work on conversion rate. Here's the team. And they, they showed up for the, the stand-up, and they, they disappeared. So uh, what I failed to do there was to create a structure that made it welcoming for them, that made it easy for them to work with us, that made the um, uh, engineers um, and the, the non-engineers uh, gave them a, a, a framework to work to. So uh, one that's tremendously helpful there is to, to um, buddy them up. So you say, okay, um, you're going to help this person be productive and find uh, good ways to interact with the team. And uh, you might want to give that to a somewhat more senior developer within the team, uh, somebody who's um, a little more knowledgeable uh, about the business. And uh, that person can then work with, say, the, the, the finance person who's working on the reports and uh, trying to make sure they're useful to finance or the invoicing system or whatever it is, and make sure that that person finds a home and, and they don't feel lost and they don't just disappear after the standup. So uh, buddying up uh, can be very helpful. And um, more generally, uh, making sure there's some accountability uh, for that person, for the team's success. So um, a, another way to screw this up is to say, okay, loan me some people um, over there in marketing, you know, give me some somebody to work with us. And they say, sure, you know, so-and-so will come and visit you. Um, but what they mean is we'll still give them all the same responsibilities they used to have, and they'll go talk to tech as well. Guess who loses in that process? Uh, it's no surprise that they look after their blog posts or their tweets or whatever it is uh, instead of spending their time on um, making sure that the technology d deals with, uh, with their specialist area of knowledge. So what you want is for those folks to have responsibility and accountability for uh, uh, contributing to the team's success and that they're part of the team's success. So uh, when the team actually improves conversion rate, they're not only getting credit, but they're also um, um, their manager um, on the uh, marketing team, say, is, is aware of what they're doing. That comes into um, uh, evaluations for them and so forth. Um, but um, in, in the shorter term, making sure that uh, they are accountable, say, to you, if you're the CTO, uh, that you're regularly meeting with them and saying, what have you got done? How is this contributing? Maybe your um, team lead or your uh, product manager is evaluating that, making sure that there's uh, accountability from them for their contribution. 
Um, and if they don't know how to make it, and this is very common in the early days, this person will show up and, and not really know how to, to work well. The team will not know how to absorb them. You'll set up some structures and it won't, won't work right. You need to know that early. Uh, but if you put in place that accountability and that structure, you can get tremendous value from, uh, from these folks. Okay. Um, I'm running uh, low on stuff, which is perfectly fine, but I want more questions. I'm also dropping my notes, sorry. Um, so uh, I have at least one more story to tell, uh, which I will certainly do. But if you guys don't ask me more questions, I might finish early. That's okay. I don't mind that. Uh, I hope I'm uh, giving you interesting value. I'm certainly in entertaining myself and coming up with good ideas, which is uh, always the most fun and the, the best part. But um, please ask me more questions now uh, so that uh, I can make sure to deal with whatever it is that brought you here and whatever uh, puzzles and questions you're having in this area. Uh, ben, make sure to let me know if I answered your question uh, effectively because I, I might have missed something. I'd like to, to fix that. So um, let me tell you a, a, a couple of stories uh, about how this... Um, uh, how this goes well and how it doesn't go well. Um, and one of them, I can't read my handwriting. I apologize. I am definitely getting old. Okay, well, if I remember that story, I'll tell you, but let me tell you the very funny one. Um, so I was working with a uh, company that sold on Facebook, and uh, they sold a really amazing product. Uh, it almost sold itself. It was just very exciting. Uh, they were kind of uh, swallowed by their own success. Um, they couldn't grow fast enough to keep up with demand for this um, very exciting product. And it was a very seasonal demand. So at Christmas, everybody wanted to, to buy this product. And this was the time when Facebook was um, just a marketer's dream. You could sell almost anything. That's um, diminished somewhat these days. But uh, back then, man, it, it was the place to be. And so we said, well, one way that we can boost capacity, one way we can get more done is uh, to make these teams much more cross-functional. And we'll, we'll get people across the business collaborating together and we'll give them a lot of autonomy. We'll make sure that they are really ready to do whatever we ask them to do, that they can uh, complete, um, uh, uh, that they'll have objectives and, and they'll have the power uh, to, to work to those objectives. And uh, th this worked great most of the time because what we had was, uh, say, uh, finance people working closely with the uh, um, folks who were uh, designing the payment systems. And, and so we, we were really sure that the payment systems would produce invoices that the finance people could reconcile. And that worked great. Uh, we were very glad about that. Uh, unfortunately, in at least one case, uh, we forgot the accountability component. I mentioned that before, but uh, here we forgot accountability for the team. And what happened to the team was the, the, this particular team was um, tasked with um, uh, optimizing the Facebook adverts. And that was the way the lifeblood of the business. Everything was advertised on Facebook. And the more they could get in front of the right eyeballs at the right time with the people who had the right intent to buy a type of a product like the one we had, boy, they were ready to go. And that was fantastic. Oh, I remembered the other story, which is at the same company. So I'll, I'll come back to that. So I'll end with a good story. This is the story of the, a cautionary tale. So uh, uh, what this um, uh, team did, which was tasked with improving the uh, Facebook ads, is they, they made them really efficient. And they actually figured out how to bid on the right keywords at a tremendous rate. Uh, so they were bidding uh, very, very frequently and, and really optimizing to get just the right keyword at just the right moment and to, to arbitrage between the, the uh, a, a word like uh, children and a word like child or something like that you know they were they were really um, uh, getting the, the uh, to, to very small improvements but uh, they were milking every improvement they could out of the the algorithms that they could uh, create and, and because they had, marketing and advertising experts who really understood Facebook, sitting next to engineers who were really good at creating um, very clever systems that could trade very fast on the keyword marketplace. Uh, they practically built a high frequency trading system within Facebook. And the problem is that Facebook wasn't ready for a high frequency trading system. So they actually managed to crash Facebook servers, which is quite a trick. Facebook was already huge by that point. And, and you would think that, uh, you know, they would have rate limits in place and so on. These guys were clever enough to figure out how to get around it. Well, you can imagine Facebook wasn't very happy about that. 
So this kind of backfired on us and made it harder for us to advertise and we got worse rates and when we got more limited and so on. Um, so the, the difficulty we had was that um, the, the, this team was so focused on this outcome uh, that they kind of lost sight of everything else and they didn't realize that they were over-optimizing. They, they were doing more than the business really needed. We, we didn't need to save uh, every penny on every keyword on every advert. Uh, main goal was to just get large volumes. And uh, the, the problem with the cross-functionality of it was that they were, they were too capable. <laughs> they were too much of a Swiss Army knife and able to, to do too much. So what we were missing there was a mechanism for accountability, which we then put in place. So we had a, a, a process where their, the work of each um, of these autonomous cells uh, would uh, um, be reviewed by somebody senior who looked after a, a large piece of the business. Um, and, and so that person was able to say, hang on, folks, you're going too far, or um, you know, we don't need to invest that much here, or we need to do more here. Let me give you more resources. Uh, and that was a very helpful, important component of um, uh, running in this um, uh, very broad way. So that's my cautionary tale. But let me uh, finish because I don't see any questions. So I'm assuming you guys are all happy. Of stunned silence. You're you're amazed by my brilliance, or you you're uh, you disagree so strongly you don't want to tell me. I'm not sure which. Throw in a question if you want to get one in before we're finished. But let me let me finish with a, a really heartwarming, exciting, amazing story. So um, uh, the same customer, and, and I, I mentioned children before, they made a, a children's product. I'm not going to go into exactly which one. But uh, the, they made a children's product which required tremendous creativity. So there were uh, there was a kind of a part of the building in which, um, you know, if you've ever seen pictures of Pixar, uh, it, it looked like that. There were just um, children's uh, designs and toys and um, stories and things everywhere. There's this, this um, highly creative environment um, to, to stimulate um, these uh, amazing storytellers and thinkers and um, people who, who knew how to, to play like they were children. Um, uh, to, to come up with even more amazing items because their their goal was to take their one item that had taken off and to, to branch out into many, which they were very successful in doing uh, because of this highly creative environment. Uh, and what we did is we put the engineers right next to those folks. And, and we, we did that consciously. We made sure that the engineers were sitting right next to this extremely creative, extremely weird environment. You can imagine quite how strange this might have been, people coming in and singing and dancing and um, uh, um, uh, playing games together. And um, uh, creative people are, are pretty weird <laughs> compared to us straight-laced engineers. You know, we're, we're interested in lightsabers and, and how many uh, uh, Vulcans there are on, on the planet Vulcan. They, they, they were uh, quite a lot wilder than us. But um, there was huge amounts of interaction because they were near to each other physically. Uh, in cases like Ben's, uh, you might need to create that. You might need to do more structure, as I was talking about, to, to create that kind of interaction. But we got it organically. We were lucky. And uh, because of that, uh, we had um, lots of creative ideas that flowed over from them to the engineers. And they would say, uh, hey, could we do this on, on the payment page? And the engineers would say, I'm not used to being very creative on the payment page. And you know, I'm not used to things moving around and, and stuff looking different that worries users, but hey, we can try it. And, and that became um, a huge uh, value uh, in our branding, um, that we could be a very different type of uh, payment experience, different type of purchase experience, um, because uh, we had this creativity kind of leaking over from uh, the, these uh, wild and crazy people who were creating the product, and it, uh, the product that we actually sold, the physical thing that came in the post, and that leaked over into the website and the payments and the designs and the emails and the other things that the engineers were doing, which would normally be pretty boring. So, um, I hope that's an inspiring story for you. It's a, one I uh, like to remember and, and uh, have very positive feelings about. Um, and that's the sort of thing that you can get if you create these um, highly, very, very broad, beyond cross-functional teams that include people from all across the business. You can get tremendous amounts of knowledge and value leaking over into your engineering team. Um, but uh, I'll remind you that you need structure and accountability and you need mechanisms for uh, these folks to be productive. If you do that, you can get tremendous value. So um, let me just uh, stick up where you can uh, find more of this if this was interesting to you. Um, so that's at squirrelsquadron.com, which I will stick up here on the screen. And uh, as I say, we have uh, 
uh, events every week like this. They're free. This is my way of giving back as a consultant. You know, I work with hundreds of companies and uh, I want to get these stories out. I want people to know the sorts of things they can do. And um, there's uh, recordings on the forum of, uh, uh, I think we've probably had 100 of these events now, maybe at least 75 um, over the last couple of years uh, uh, on all these different topics. So you can uh, check those out on the forum. Uh, you can uh, come to future events. And I'd love to see those of you in London uh, in person on November 16th talking about how to measure your tech team. Uh, I think Ben says uh, the question was answered. So that's good. I'm glad I covered that. If you've got more questions and more thoughts, there'll be a follow-up on the forum with more ideas and more discussion. Uh, so I'd love to see you there. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you in the future. David says, uh, great stories, enjoyed the session. So uh, I certainly enjoyed it as well, David. I'm, I'm glad you like the stories. That's my favorite part. Have a wonderful day and I will see you next week and at future events. Wonderful day. Take care. See you guys.